Victoria wants to know, will this help diabetes type one? That's a really good question. So diabetes type one is an autoimmune disease, right? Uh, and it's one that affects the islet cells that produce uh, your insulin. Uh, so on the one hand, if those are gone and you can't produce physically the insulin that you used to, then you will continue to have the illness even if the autoimmune component goes away, right? Now, speaking from results, yes, uh, every person I've worked with with type one diabetes has actually had uh, greatly improved blood sugar control and lowered their insulin needs. So whether or not that was because their insulin resistance went down, because people have insulin resistance, even with type one diabetes, if their diet is not dialed in. So either it's because the insulin resistance went down or is it because there's more insulin produced? Not really able to say that, but definitely can say that there's great improvements and it's worth doing for sure. All right, Instagram. Oh, look at all the hearts. You guys are always so nice. I love Instagram for that reason. I just feel loved uh, to look over and just see hearts. <laughs> All right, let me scroll down and see uh, if I can find a question for all of you. Or now that I'm in Texas, all of y'all get practice at. Does that sound weird with a New York accent? All right. Uh, Arunava, what is in your smoothie? Uh, magic. All right. So uh, the smoothies that we make are our way of delivering nourishment or what I call hyper nourishment. So hyper nourishment is a protocol that we developed that is an intentional overdose in nutrition that your body uses for cellular repair and optimizing immune function. And so when we originally came out with it, it was, uh, well, <laughs> it didn't taste that good. I was making people eat tons and tons of vegetables the way I did it when I got better. Um, and what we found is if we put it all into a blender and blend it, uh, people will drink it and it tastes good. So what's in the smoothie, smoothie is really a delivery device for cruciferous vegetables and leafy greens, uh, flax, chia, and water. That's what they are. The fruit's there for flavor. So um, the ones that we usually drink are actually on our free website. So smoothieshred.com is a website that my husband built as a public service. And it has videos of us coaching on different things about lifestyle and um weight loss, disease. It's completely free. You don't have to log in. It's, you know, you, you can just look at it. It also has free recipes in it that are super easy. That are just frozen fruit, uh, greens, water, flax or chia. So just go there. Those are the ones we drink. They're super, super easy to make and you don't have to buy my book or anything. You can just use the free ones. So maybe try to have any folks asking questions, Leo? Not yet. People, oh. A lot of people watching, but no questions. They know what to do. All right, cool. All right, let me see. Uh, just Sheila wants to know if you could switch from the six week program to the four week program. Sure. Absolutely. Um, why don't you, um, go ahead and send me a message and put all caps in the, uh, DRG at goodbyelupus.com. Put all caps in your, uh, email subject so that it'll flag me and I can talk to you about whether or not that, that makes sense for you. Um, okay. Let's see. Instagram. Oh, you guys are so nice. Thank you. Thank you for all the love. Um, I love it. Germany, Australia, all these folks. Okay. Uh, Eric wants to know, or Erica Higi, how successful has your protocol been for people with multiple sclerosis? Is there a complete reversal? So multiple sclerosis, uh, it's an autoimmune disease that affects the central nervous system and it can affect people's ability to have muscle function, bladder control. Uh, and it could cause a lot of disability. I've had a lot of people with MS do my program at this point. And they do really, really well. The, the changes in symptoms really depend on how progressed the illness is. So for example, I've had people who had early onset who were having early symptoms who had full reversal back to normal, right? Uh, Sarah Ramos made a video for me about that. She did my rapid recovery group, had full reversal. She's running 5Ks and loves life, right? I'll say the name if they posted a video of themselves, okay? Don't ever worry that I would do it otherwise. <laughs> Um, uh, versus, um, so I can tell you an example in a recent rapid recovery group, we had two gentlemen with pretty severe, uh, MS. One was only in his twenties, but he's at end stage and he can only, uh, he has the flaccid paralysis, meaning his muscles don't really work. They're very, very weak. He can't really do anything for himself. And so his wife, uh, takes care of him. She feeds him, she dresses him, right? Um, and he doesn't really have any ability to do that for himself. The other gentleman, a uh, couple decades older, but was able to still, he was mostly in a wheelchair, but could stand up, but couldn't really stand on his own for very long. Hadn't been able to go up or downstairs for three years, right? So very limited mobility. Uh, that man who I just described, 
Uh, by week five, he showed us a video of himself walking up the stairs. Now it was shaky. If you haven't gone upstairs for three years and you're mostly in a wheelchair, your muscles are weak. So it was wobbly, but he did it. He was walking to the mailbox, standing there to check the mail. So incredible improvements. And his goal is to go run that 5k. Uh, it's like once you have a mess, the goal seems to be to run the 5k. So absolutely extraordinary. The gentleman that was already at the late stage where he had no real voluntary movement on his own, his wife said the stiffness went away. So he was very stiff and stuck. So it wasn't flaccid. I'm sorry. He was stuck. He was stiff. And so it was very hard for her to, to change him and to move him. And she said she was able to move him easily. So he loosened up. The problem was he still isn't at the point where he can stand up or feed himself. Right. So they both had incredible improvement. Um, and very short period of time. I mean, six weeks is 42 days, uh, improvement that did not happen with any medication and it was life changing, but the quality of life difference is still very big. So, uh, the other thing we've seen is we've had a few people who actually had MRIs done post group, which MRIs are expensive and most people can't do that. But the people who had the follow up MRIs all showed that there were no new lesions. And, uh, for three of them out of four, uh, the most recent lesion was completely gone. So that correlated with the symptoms going away that those recent lesions went away as well. So that is really good case for a reversal. The old lesions that were already scar tissue and the old symptoms still were there. Now, could more time help with that? We can see, but it does show that really, really effective reversal for MS. Um, how long you've had it is going to be a difference again in your, in your quality of life. So the sooner the better always for any, for any disease truly. So you should have anything. So we got one okay. um, question. How do I heal from the diverticulitis? Okay, so the question from Smoothie Shred is how can you heal from diverticulitis? So diverticulitis uh, is inflammation. So anything in that's called ends in itis. So uh, there's all this Latin in medicine just to make doctors sound smarter. Uh, but itis means inflammation, right? So diverticulitis uh, is you have inflammation of these diverticuli, which are pockets in your in your colon. So anything that can cause inflammation in the body can cause inflammation in the bowel. Um, if you have these pockets, sometimes something specifically irritated that as well. Uh, in general, what I do for diverticulitis is the same thing that I've done to reverse Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is really a very low inflammatory diet. I have not seen a problem where they can't eat flax or chia seeds. Um, first of all, we blend them. So there's no like seed to get stuck. Plus, uh, GI docs say that that's old news. It's not really a seed that usually gets stuck there. Uh, most of the problems that people have when they have diverticulitis is highly inflammatory diets, meat heavy, processed food heavy, heavy, dairy heavy, creates inflammation along the bowel, especially in these pockets, which can then get swollen shut, cause trapped uh, food particles in there, can get inflammation and infection in there. So I would say the same thing that we do to bring down inflammation throughout the digestive system you would do there. If it's very, very inflamed, you might have to do some bowel rest. I mean, if people have a severe case, oftentimes they can't eat. Um, they might have to do water or fresh pressed juices until the pain comes down. And then I would start introducing smoothies. And, and then eventually when all symptoms are back to normal, then the more solid foods, that's the way I would do it. Okay, let's see here. So over to Facebook. Okay. Uh, Thank you for all the nice comments over here too. You guys are all the best. All right, let's see here. All right, these, uh, they're going by so quickly. It's hard to help. Okay, so um, fibromyalgia. All right, I'll just ask about fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is a really interesting disease because there's arguments about it, right? So fibromyalgia is a syndrome of people that have uh, pain and depression or anxiety. They're linked together. So it is a disease of inflammation and emotional uh, duress or stress. So those things are and cause and effect, right? So um, it is believed currently that it is the depression, anxiety, or trauma that then causes the pain syndrome. So those are married together. And as those of you who've been watching me know, uh, when you have high stress, high emotional, emotional distress, it causes inflammation, which then causes pain. So it's real pain, right? It's not made up in any way. Um, so working with people with fibro, uh, I really do the work of the emotional work to overcome anxiety, depression, and trauma, and pure hypernourishment to get those cells to repair themselves as quickly as possible. That combination of the two is the most effective. And it's, it's really held up um, over time that that's what we need to do. Interestingly, um, you know, Lady Gaga, a couple of years ago, uh, she interviewed with Oprah and she said that she has fibromyalgia that was debilitating and she got dramatically better when she went 
for inpatient uh, DBT, which is a specialized therapy for trauma. So, uh, so improving her trauma dramatically helped her pain more than any of the other medications had. So, all right, let's see. All right, Bally Berry. I want to start the program, and I want to be able to get past the fact that I can't have leafy greens because of blood clots or vitamin K, depending on my INR. So it sounds like you take Coumadin or Warfarin. So um, unfortunately, the information gets diluted a lot that um, that anyone with blood clots should avoid leafy greens. That's not the case at all with vitamin K. Uh, the The problem is that specific medicine, Coumadin and Warfarin, two different names for the same medicine, its effectiveness. Uh, is uh, reduced by high levels of vegetable intake, but there's a solution for that. Well, there's multiple solutions and I've worked with a lot of people with this problem, okay? I used to have uh, antiphospholipid antibodies and blood clots and my solution was I didn't take Coumadin, I took injectable blood thinners. That way it had no impact on what I ate because it wasn't even in the digestive system, it went right into the veins. So one thing you can do, as you can change blood thinners. Uh, there are new blood uh, blood thinners out there that are much newer than Coumadin that do not have any dietary restriction at all. A lot of doctors are reticent or hesitant to use them because they're used to Coumadin. They like it, it's reliable, we know what it is. Um, but the newer ones don't have that issue. So you could talk to your doctor about, hey, can we try something else, either an injectable or a different pill that'll give me the blood thinning but won't have to affect my diet. The other thing that works, and I've had people do this even in my rapid recovery programs, is you just change the dosage of your medicine to go with your diet instead of the other way around. Instead of starving yourself of the nutrition you need to heal in order to easily maintain your medicine dose, change your medicine dose to go with your diet. So they have home INR machines where you can test your own INR and make sure your INR stays good, uh, even with your level of the diet. So we want the meds to be the thing that's being moved up and down, you want the diet to be healing because ultimately you want to reduce your need for medicine overall. So I hope that helps. All right. I've been hypernourishing for about a month. I have been diagnosed with breast cancer and the radiation doctor says I need to eliminate omega-3s during and post uh, radiation. Is this true? I have never heard that before. So the question from Smoothie Shred is somebody with breast cancer, her the, her doctor told her that if she's getting radiation, she should never eat omega-3s uh, for the treatments. That's a new one. <laughs> I've heard a lot of really crazy things. One of them was um, that I've heard multiple times, which really is scary, is that people with cancer are getting treatment shouldn't eat any healthy foods because it'll make the cancer stronger. No, you need your immune system stronger so it can fight back against the cancer, right? So um, I don't know if they gave you an explanation for why, but absolutely not. I mean, we've had people do extremely well using our program uh, with their treatments um, for remissions and even people in our groups who've had markers come down even just with nutrition alone. We've also had people who've done rapid recovery with us to recover from the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, like neuropathies and chronic fatigue and brain fog. So I think if you can do hypernourishment while getting those treatments, that's the best thing you can do. He'd have to really give me an explanation that was based in some real science and results. And I have a feeling he won't be able to do that. So that is really strange. I hope that you are on the full plan and I hope you're feeling better. So please let us know uh, how you're doing, okay? Uh, Facebook, all right, let's see. Um, okay. Hi, doctor. This is from Sarah. I have lupus, Sjogren's, uh, vasculitis, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, uh, which took away my ability to walk. I'm learning to walk again. Can this help me? Goodness, you are a great example of the fact that autoimmune disease tends to just grow new branches, right? You get one and then suddenly you got all, all these other ones. Uh, I remember those days very well. Um, yeah, so we had somebody... We've had two people now with CIDP uh, do our rapid recovery group for it and were able to not only walk, but run again. Uh, it was absolutely great. There was one gentleman who did our group. Um, gosh, I got to get him to make a video. Uh, when I first met him for a wellness appointment, he literally had to crawl on his hands and knees into the kitchen to make smoothies for himself. Um, he got so much better doing it that way. He decided to join the group to get the fastest possible result. And by the end of the six weeks, he was literally running. Uh, it's been an extraordinary gift for him and his whole family, especially being a dad. Uh, so all of your illnesses, this is the path. And realize that 
The reason for that is because our protocols are not specific for diseases. They're specific for cellular repair and immune function. So that helps you with any of those illnesses, whether it's going to be cancer or diabetes or autoimmune diseases. Uh, you want your body's ability to repair itself to be optimized. So that's exactly what you do. And I hope you're feeling better really soon. I'm glad to hear that you're walking again or learning to walk again. All right, let's see. All right, Ashley, Christina, do the smoothies help during cold flu COVID season? I can't take immune boosters with MS. Yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Um, I don't know if you saw, but uh, gosh, it was some months ago. When did I post that video, Leo, with the COVID and the flu? That was, maybe it was over the, it couldn't have been over the summer. Maybe it's been a couple months. I don't know. Uh, they did a study actually at John Hopkins where, where they, uh, the, the same people who did the study that proved that cruciferous vegetables kill cancer cells in a petri dish, uh, which is great information for cancer. Remember? Um, they also just did a study that proved that, uh, that cruciferous vegetables prevent the, uh, the mRNA in the flu virus and the COVID virus from replicating. It decreases replication by 50, 50%. Cuts the replication in half. What does that mean for you? If the DNA can't, re if the virus can't replicate itself as quickly, that gives your immune system more time to kill it. It gives your immune system time to catch up. So uh, whether it's COVID or the flu, uh, hypernourishment is going to keep your immune system really, really strong because what do we do in hypernourishment? We're overdosing in those cruciferous vegetables as well as the omega-3s uh, and the water intake your body needs to, op uh, to function optimally. So that is a really great thing to do in addition to helping your MS. So the shred. It's all online that ill Carlitine can help with PCOS with, uh, what are your feelings about supplements like this? I don't have feelings. I only speak from results. So I have not used L-carnitine to treat that or to get results in it. So I won't comment on it. I never comment on things that I just read. Uh, I only comment on things that I've tested and seen results in. Uh, but we have had people do extremely well with PCOS in our, uh, in our program. I mean, we've had some people do testimonial videos about that as well, who've had extremely great recoveries, uh, in symptoms from PCOS. So make sure you're doing that. That I can tell you works. Um, but in terms of those kinds of supplements, I just haven't tested them to give you the answer for that. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, let's go to Facebook. Lou, uh, Louise, if you have lupus, do you have to stay on Plaquenil for the rest of your life, even on this plan? In my experience, no. Uh, the goal, listen, the goal is to get yourself as healthy as you can possibly get so you can have the best life you can possibly have, right? Now, if that means that you require some medicines to me, great. Western medicine keep me, kept me alive for a dozen years where I was otherwise going to be dead. You know, if just natural selection was happening, I was going to be out by 16. All right. So thank goodness for Western medicine. Right. So if you need a medicine in order to feel amazing and you feel amazing, then good. I'm really glad. Right. So my first goal with folks is number one, let's get the symptoms to go away. All right. When the symptoms go away, usually that's when people start talking to their doctor about their um, about their medicines. Right. So for people who are not in areas where I practice, uh, they have to have their doctors work on their medicines for them. I'm just doing nutrition, lifestyle stuff. I can interpret things, you know, I can look at tests and things, but I can't, you know, prescribe or change people's prescriptions. But usually that's the case is that when their symptoms go away uh, and then the labs get better, usually that's when the discussion happens where the doctor goes, oh, it's time to start tapering these things. Now, there are some doctors that will say, well, whatever's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And they won't want to decrease those medicines. And that'll be a discussion for you to have for them. But most folks I see, that's what they do is they get the, the remission first, and then they start working with their doctors on tapering. So like I said, if somehow you needed some Plaquenil to maintain your remission, but you felt amazing and had no symptoms, I would still call that a win. But most of the time, what I see is that people are already symptomatic on their meds. They change their diet. That's when the symptoms go away. And that's when they start talking about that tapering. So, all right, Insta, let's see what you got going on. Time check. Okay. CC, will hypernourishment affect with colitis? So hypernourishment is really important for healing colitis. It's really interesting that uh, the doctors that are most tasked with helping people's intestines heal 
also have a general belief that diet doesn't impact your intestines, where your intestines are the only thing that are actually in physical contact with your diet besides your mouth and your esophagus and your stomach, right? So the food goes through your digestive system, physically touches it and makes contact with it. And GI docs are typically like, yeah, eat whatever you want. <laughs> so uh, that bothers me. And I do know some plant-based GI folks, so not you guys. Um, but it, typically that's what we're taught. I mean, in medicine in general, we're taught diet really doesn't have an effect on health. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on making things better. I've taught a lot of med students, but anyway. So one of the most important things you can do to get rid of inflammation in your colon is change your diet so that you're not putting things that create physical distress and inflammation into your colon. If you watch my online classes, I talked about a study done years ago, Scientific American, where they showed that, um, that just dairy alone causes inflammation along the intestinal walls in mammals, right? And sometimes even bleeding. So if you're eating dairy products, if you're eating animal fats, all of those things, you're going to create some inflammation, which can lead to things like what they think of now as leaky gut, uh, which is why I cringe inwardly and outwardly when people say that you should eat stuff like bone broth for colitis. I'm like, you're just exposing the gut to more inflammation. So they might feel better in the moment because broth is easy to digest, right? But the impact of it being there is actually going to continue the inflammatory saga, if you will. So if the colitis is really severe where any food is causing bleeding and pain, you might need to take a break at first and take things like L-glutamine or pure curcumin to try to calm down the inflammation, start out with juices or smoothies and work your way up to food. But the protocol will be the same. The only difference is I make in colitis is how I introduce those foods to make sure that there's no pain. But the ultimate goal will be to get you to the full protocol so that you can heal completely, um, especially from whatever was causing it to begin with. All right, smoothie shredders. I suffer from kidney stones. Okay. How will eating all the greens affect that? All right, so the question is, I already have kidney stones. How will eating the greens affect that? So it depends on the cause of your kidney stones. So most people uh, who have kidney stones, the most common cause of kidney stones rather, is dehydration and actually high animal protein intake. I learned that even in medical school. It's one of the few things I read that actually talked about diet and, and illness. Um, if you're in my smoothie shred group, I'm assuming that you are no longer dehydrated uh, and eating animal proteins. But if you are, animal foods really, let's not talk about it as a protein, animal foods. Um, if you are still doing that, that's the first thing I would change. So when they looked at the causes of, of uh, kidney stones, they found that people who eat more vegetables have fewer kidney stones, not the opposite. Now, there's a lot of anti-plant-based data out there on the internet because it's not good for business, right? Like I don't get paid by big kale or big broccoli. I don't get paid for this session. Like I'm just, you know, just here to help, right? But there's a lot of industries out there that don't want people to give up their meat and their dairy and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so there's this propaganda machine and one of them is that spinach is the cause of kidney stones. It's just not the case. And in my book, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, I actually go into details about why that's, that's not correct according to science. Um, but there is a small percentage of people who are more likely to get kidney stones in general, even who are not meat eaters, even who are hydrated. Uh, there's a small percentage that have a genetic cause, which means that you will get them regardless of what you eat. It doesn't matter high oxalate, low oxalate, you're gonna get the stones, okay? Um, the other ones might have other issues causing it, kidney failure, for example, or if you've had gastric bypass or something like that. Um, so if you're someone that is sensitive to oxalates and any amount of them could contribute, um, one, you'll probably get the stones anyway, but if you wanna minimize them, all you gotta do is take out the spinach, which is the highest oxalate, but still do the other ones like kale, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, other cruciferous vegetables, because the nutrition is super, super important. Um, but that should make more of a difference. You are gonna have, people are gonna have more oxalates in general eating this way, but it is, you're not gonna necessarily have stones Stones. If you have stones, that's really the only difference you can make. But the high hydration and vegetable intake is actually going to help your kidney health, uh, your urinary health, and your overall health. Okay, time check. Fertility. So that's been an interesting thing. Uh, I can say from results, yes. Uh, I have seen it greatly impact fertility, um, so much so that we have had accidental pregnancies happen uh, multiple times 
uh, during my rapid recovery group or directly after it from people who thought they couldn't get pregnant uh, because their bodily suddenly got healthy enough that they, it decided that it was going to have babies. And they've actually all done well, thankfully. Um, but that was very, that's been interesting. The oopsie phenomenon, which I can only con attribute to people getting healthy enough that their body decided they can support it. Um, but what we've seen is that uh, in, in always, again, hypernourishment is specific to cellular repair. So when you're eating in a way that optimizes cellular repair, it's going to go through your whole bloodstream and then your body decides, you know, where you need it most, right? So for example, if you've got, uh, if you've got a problem in your kidney, if you've got a problem in your ovary, if you've got a problem in your thyroid, your body's going to decide where the repair work needs to be. So I've seen endometriosis go away completely when someone needed to have surgery. I've seen uh, ovarian cysts go away. I've seen an ovarian tumor go away from a doctor who did my first rapid recovery group in 2017. She had a tumor that she was supposed to get surgery on that disappeared after the six weeks. Um, I've seen people who uh, had severe symptoms of um, you know, whether it's during their periods, pain and discomfort during their periods or after them or menopausal symptoms, all who've reported it gotten better. People who couldn't get their periods regular at all suddenly became regular. That happened to me. I never had a regular period till I changed my diet. Like at the same time the lupus went away, I suddenly was like, boom, regular. It was really interesting. Um, so in many different areas, I've seen improvements in reproductive health and I've seen more people uh, be able to suddenly get pregnant that couldn't before. Uh, so there's nothing better you can do for your health. So you just take it as far as you can. Um, oh, well, thank you. I wish you, I'd met you sooner too then, but you know, right now is always the right time. We can't look backwards. We have to look forwards. You know, like if I had known about green smoothies at 16, I wouldn't have been able to help thousands of people reverse their diseases. Right? So like we just find out when we find out and then we just keep going and, and keep living. Right? If you woke up today, there's a lot of time to just create the best life you can right now. So don't do that to yourself. All right. Um, let's see here. Oh, I love this. Irma just said, Yes, do this protocol. Dr. G has finally figured it out. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I wish I knew when I was diagnosed with lupus and mixed connective tissue disease in my 30s. I'm 68 now and finally healthy. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what I love doing this. Um, and I love being, being here with all you guys um, because one, I can help support you and teach you, but two, you support and inspire each other. So it's pretty cool. All right. Uh, let's see what Instagram's asking me. All right, so S. Lily wants to know, is it possible to reverse Hashimoto's disease? And are there any vegetables or grains that you have to avoid? I follow whole food plant-based diet, no oil. Uh, yes, I actually have great results in reversing Hashimoto's. It, it's the most common autoimmune disease people have. It's just not treated as an autoimmune disease. And the reason for that in Western medicine is very simple. It's because in Western medicine, the thyroid's considered disposable, right? Uh, you can replace it with a pill. So you're not gonna put someone with Hashimoto's on a whole regimen of immunosuppression and steroids and all the side effects that come with that when you can just let the disease run its course and replace it with a pill, right? Now, the problem with that is you have unchecked autoimmune disease, which will eventually cause more things like arthritis and other issues. So many people I see who have new onset of autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, Sjogren's, they actually had Hashimoto's diagnosed a decade or more ago and then just never thought of the, they never thought of themselves as having autoimmune disease when they did. All right, so, um, so it is autoimmune, which means my protocol works. The goodbye autoimmune disease protocol works really, really well. And yes, cruciferous vegetables are good for thyroid healing. That's why it goes away. And we can track it going away. What I recommend you do is you get your thyroid markers, your antibodies checked, not just your TSH and all that, but the antibodies. Because as you heal, those antibodies will die off because your antibodies have a lifespan. So as you get better, the antibodies die off. And when the antibodies are gone, you can say goodbye Hashimoto's. Then you'll find out how much thyroid you have left. Your thyroid will heal as much as it can. And some people continue to need some thyroid hormone because it's old damage. It's scar tissue. Scar tissue is dead. It's just not going to, there's no glands, right? Uh, but most people find that they can reduce their thyroid hormone because they had inflamed tissue that actually improved. 
and even the folks that can still need the medicine feel better because all the other aspects of their life is better and they don't have autoimmune disease anymore. Uh, so you don't need to limit anything like that. You do need to take iodine though. I was just, um, today was my enigma day. Uh, the, the people who come to me for my wellness sessions usually have unusual problems, right? You don't go to the raw vegetable lady unless nobody else helped you, right? There's anything else sounds better. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've always been good at and, and even when I was a resident, my, um, my attendings used to send me the tough cases because I, I, when I listen to a story and I, my wellness sessions are 75 minutes because I want to hear the whole story. And what happens is my brain starts putting pieces together of like what single thing could cause all those symptoms rather than the way medicine is usually taught is like divide the body into this many pieces and everybody solve it separately. Usually there's one reason that can cause many things. And the problem that I solved today was someone who was diagnosed Hashimoto's a long time ago, but was never really treated or anything, but was told her thyroid was fine. Um, she was starting to have some symptoms. Uh, we want her, I, and I think it's related to her thyroid, but one of the, the problems that she has is she didn't take iodine. You need iodine to make thyroid hormone. Iodine for a healthy person, 150 micrograms a day is what you need. That's what you need. If you have hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, you need 200 micrograms a day. Where did these numbers come from? They've done clinical trials, they've tested it, and they found Hashimoto's 200 micrograms a day. Too much, you poison the thyroid and you're worse. Not enough, you don't have enough iodine to produce thyroid hormone and you're worse, right? So you gotta get that down. Well, she listened to me online, she heard me say it, but she had a naturopath who told her iodine's poison for the thyroid, don't take it. And so the symptoms she's having, I believe of her, it are purely because she is now iodine deficient and her thyroid is malfunctioning. So you do need to make sure no matter what, all of you guys, that you're getting your daily iodine. It's so important for the thyroid and brain function that the US government many decades ago put it into table salt because everybody used salt and it was an easy way to get somebody the supplement that we all need. There are areas in the world where people have serious illness in their brains or thyroids because they are iodine depleted. So the problem is nowadays, a lot of people have switched over and they're not using iodized salt. And so their TSH is going up, but it's not Hashimoto's it's iodine deficiency. So. All of that to say, when you eat cruciferous vegetables, it can compete and block some of the iodine absorption. That's why they got a bad rep. But uh, if you're taking your iodine and you just take it separately from your cruciferous vegetables, you get all the benefits of the cruciferous, you get all the benefits of the iodine, and then you can say goodbye Hashimoto's. So that's my long-winded answer to that. But I like to explain these in a way where you can understand how things work so that you can make better decisions. If you understand the how, it's easier to understand what to do versus she said this and he said this. So I hope that helps. All right, smoothie shred. We probably can do another couple rounds. I found out that I'm intolerant to chia and flax seeds. How would somebody go about getting omega threes with their bodies having reactions to those seeds? All right, so uh, the question is, I found out I'm intolerant to flax and chia seeds. What can I do for omega threes? Um, so. What I would wanna know actually is more info about what that means. So like, did you get a sensitivity test done? Do you have a physical reaction? And then I'd want, if it's a physical reaction, I would wanna figure out, is that a reaction to fats? Like, do you have a gallbladder issue? Is it a reaction that's allergic? So I don't have enough info. Um, one of the things that I do if somebody has uh, an issue with the seeds, um, that something in the seed irritates them, sometimes the cold press flax or chia oil works because they've all, if you take the lignin free kind, they filtered out all the shell, which has the ingredients people react to, it has the pure oil in it. Uh, that sometimes will solve the problem. Um, if not, there are other things out there. I just haven't tested them with my programs. So for example, you can buy algae oil, but you have to be really careful with algae oil because they often will, uh, they, they dilute it uh, or dissolve it into sunflower oil or safflower oil, which are high omega-6 oils. And that's going to get, you're gonna lose the effect of getting more omega-3. So if you find one that's maybe in coconut oil or olive oil, that could do it. But the dosages are usually pretty small. Um, there are some other ones out there that people have shown me that are from some Asian countries, like different things where they're supposed to be high omega-3. I just haven't tested them. So, um, so that's where I would start with you, but mostly I would need more information to figure out what the issue actually is to see if there's some other way that we can find around it. So, um, all right, let me see here. Facebook. Oh, Beverly, I'm almost healed for your protocol. Yay, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. You guys all share this with each other because people need to hear it. People who are teetering on the edge, 
they need to see other people's results, you know? Um, let me see. So that's great. Let me know when you're fully healed. Okay, these are going by fast now. Um, ooh, all right, Pradeep, my seven-year-old, um, uh, my seven-year-old is diagnosed with lupus nephritis, two plus protein, can your protocol help? So first of all, um, I'm sorry to hear that your daughter is sick. I know you must be absolutely terrified. I mean, seven-year-old baby, um, that's a really, really scary thing. And with a disease like lupus, um, my mom, I think is still traumatized and I've been lupus free for 17 years. Um, but being told that when I was 16, that I was in stage four failure, she's never quite recovered from it fully. And if you watch the video I did with her, um, it, mostly against her will, but for you guys, uh, we talked about that a bit. Um, it's really important mom that you take care of yourself so that you don't get sick. Okay. Number two, yes, absolutely, we can get her better. I have worked with so many kids at this point, which is really sad because when I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis at 16, I was told I was very young for the diagnosis. Nowadays, I've treated people as young as two, um, and it's not uncommon at all. If you saw recently, I posted a text message from a mom of a 12-year-old who uh, had only been on my protocol for a few weeks and her tests are negative, no more proteinuria. Doctor says she doesn't need to come back for three months. And he was the one who wanted to start chemo, right? So um, she's young, her body is in cell building mode. We just need to get her on the right diet and her body will fix itself, it will. In my experience so far, the kids have all gotten better and quickly. So um, I have not yet had a kid not get their kidney function back, okay? so. Um, what I recommend though, is that you work with me. So in general, I just, I, I want the information to be free and I want everybody to heal. You know, I might get a day off here and there eventually if people just start listening to my free content, right? But when you are, um, when, when you've got an organ that could be failing or when it's a kid or there's a special case, it's safer to work with me is what I'm saying. So if you don't already have an appointment, please make one, do a rush appointment so you can get in within eight weeks. I, that is a rush for me. Um, and then you can always text me, uh, you know, for updates or cancellations, we'll find a way to, to get you in as soon as possible. But that's what I recommend. That way I can find out her specific issues, her eating patterns. I can design a diet just for her. And then you can be in touch with me. Everybody that I work with, you get my cell phone number so that you can update me, send me labs, keep me in the loop so I can stay on top of things. As much, if I can manage people over text and they don't have to see me again, I actually prefer it. Um, but uh, but let's, let's, let's get her started. You can at least get her off meat dairy if you haven't already. But that way, uh, if you get an appointment with me, we can make sure everything's optimized for and get her healthy again. There's a lot of hope you can do this, okay? Make sure you also do it as a family. Um, it is not, uh, it, it's not like the foods that are bad for her are, are I'm assuming it's a her. The, uh, yeah, I said daughter. It's not like the foods that are bad for her um, are good for everybody else. I think if the whole family can come together and eat healthy for each other, uh, that would be a good thing too. But hopefully I will see you soon. All right, Instagram. Didn't forget about you guys. All right, I'm trying to skip ones that are kind of, I've already talked on. Um, Liza HB, can you have your homemade ranch dressing on the rapid recovery? If you're talking about my Caesar, uh, yes, but what you do is you would replace the almonds with avocado, all right? Uh, I am fervishly working on trying to finish my recipe book. I was hoping to do it by Christmas. I don't know, guys. I've never been this busy in my life, <laughs> but um, it's, if not then, it will be soon um, where that has more things. But really all you need is one dressing you like and a smoothie you like. You're golden, you're golden. So yeah, you can absolutely use that recipe and just switch out the avocado for the nuts and it would be approved for the Pure Hyper Nourishment program we do in Rapid Recovery. By the way, we do have a Rapid Recovery group starting January 13th. Um, that'll be the next one and it'll be the first one of the year. Um, so we are more than half full now and they always do fill up completely, usually uh, two to three weeks before they start. So if you're someone who needs that kind of help, make sure you don't wait. Cause I hate getting all the sad emails uh, that you missed it. So make sure that you get in there. We won't raise the number of people um, because we need every single person to get individual attention every day. So, um, so I won't sacrifice the level of care and attention. Um, so right now we're at a cap until I figure out how to clone myself. Okay, so, all right, uh, smoothie shredders. Ready to get some water. I have DVT. Can the protocol help? All right. Can the protocol help DVT, which is a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot in the leg? 
Um, I don't know that it will dissolve the clot, but it can help whatever caused the clot. So I don't know why you have a DVT. Um, if you have a heart condition, if you have a clotting disorder, if you have a kidney disorder, um, there's so many different things, muscle breakdown, there's so many different things that can lead to clot, and I don't know what caused it. Uh, but if you have a physical giant clot, usually the treatment is medical, and they're gonna have to give you blood thinners and watch you closely to make sure that it dissolves and it doesn't move somewhere dangerous. But uh, our protocol would be most helpful to resolve the cause the cause of the problem. Okay, let's see. All right, Lee, uh, neuropathy, will diet help? So in general terms, so neuropathy would be malfunction of the nerves. Um, maybe, all right, it depends on the cause of the neuropathy. So I already mentioned that neuropathy caused by uh, cancer treatments like chemotherapy has fully resolved in our rapid recovery group from many people who've done that. Uh, neuropathy from autoimmune disease, we have seen improvement and recovery from that. Things like Guillain-Barre CIDP, we've seen recovery from that. Um, so any kind of inflammatory neuropathy, yes, but if there's nerve damage, then you might not have full repair. So for example, <clears throat> there was a gentleman I worked with who used to play competitive tennis and he always slammed his feet on that concrete all the time, all day, every day. And so he couldn't really feel his feet too much. Um, now he was in his seventies. So uh, we did my, my program with him and it result, he is no longer diabetic. He is very fit, his cholesterol's great, his blood sugar's great, everything's great, still can't feel his feet. So that neuropathy was those nerves are dead, damaged, scarred over, it wasn't inflammatory. So if it's not inflammatory or, or, or caused by an ongoing destructive or pa pattern from something going on in the body, but instead from complete damage and scar tissue, then it won't. And that's true for the body in general, right? Like when I've helped people get off the transplant list for kidney failure, and I've published that, the person didn't go up to normal kidney failure, she, or kidney function, I'm sorry, but she doubled her kidney function in 42 days and no longer needed a transplant, right? But then she hit a ceiling. So her GFR went up to like 28% from 14%, then it stayed there. But guess what, at that number, you don't need a transplant, right? So, so the goal is to give your body what it needs to repair itself as much as it can until you either get full reversal or reverse as much as you can and get a plateau. And we can, you know, we try every trick I have to push past the plateau, it doesn't work. Then we'd say, okay, that's your new level of function. So worth doing, always worth doing. Right, um, but uh, again, the cause is really important as well. Okay, let's see here. Jen Brote, have you ever healed anyone with severe mental illness? Um, yes, uh, I also am a psychiatrist. So uh, if you're talking about purely with nutrition, um, I have had cases of people who were uh, antidepressant dependent who were able to get off of their antidepressant using therapy with me and nutrition. Uh, what, you, what goes into your mouth, you've got this neck, that what gets into your bloodstream is gonna affect your brain function as well. People who are malnourished, undernourished, poorly nourished, or inflammatory food eating, they're going to have more, more mental illness, they're gonna have more problems, more depression, more attention problems, uh, but also more psychosis. Uh, there's been, it was interesting because I had a, a patient back in the day when I was medical director at a nonprofit, I used to work with the homeless and people coming out of um, juvenile justice and foster care. That's what I wanted to do. This whole lupus thing happened to me and I had to bring it to the world, but I just planned to quietly work with the homeless. You know, that was my goal. <laughs> but, uh, a, a life out of the spotlight was what I planned. <laughs> but, uh, but I had this one young man who, when he switched to a plant-based diet, uh, with schizophrenia, he actually was able to come off of his meds and had no symptoms uh, until he relapsed on meat and dairy over a weekend and his paranoia came back immediately, he got hospitalized. So that was interesting, it's a case, one case, so we can't, you know, that, it's just one case, but it was very interesting. Um, and when that happened, I actually looked at some studies and they found a correlation between dairy and psychosis. So, you know, there's definitely a connection and I've seen huge improvement. Uh, ADHD and mood disorders, high omega-3, very, very effective, as well as avoiding processed food, high nutrition intake through hypernourishment. So it definitely is helpful in, in uh, mental illness. I don't know that it's a one-stop cure without the other interventions. Um, it's kind of like if you have back pain, uh, you want to do something, you want to get physical therapy in addition to whatever the medicines or treatments you're doing. So with emotional, 
uh, diseases and mental diseases, often we need to still work through triggers and traumas and problems, but nutrition definitely supports it. And I've seen huge, huge improvements, especially in things like uh, childhood ADHD and, and mood disorders in kids that switch to plant-based eating with high nourishment, huge, huge changes compared to when they were eating, you know, lots of fast foods and junky foods beforehand. So let's see the time. All right. Okay. Is, Smoothie shred. Is depression inflammatory? Is depression inflammatory? So really good question. Current studies indicate that yes, uh, people with depression have high inflammation. Whether or not depression causes inflammation or inflation or inflammation causes depression, chicken or the egg, uh, they're connected for sure. Uh, there was one study that I read where they were so compelled by how much inflammation they found in depressed patients that one of the things that they offered in the discussion was maybe you should give prednisone to depress people, which don't know, <laughs> right? We got to talk to them. We can help people through depression. There's things we can do, but it was very, for me, you know, I really internalized that in my work because what I see in folks is people with depression and anxiety, nutrition alone is not enough. I need to do nutrition and help them overcome their, uh, their habits and their thoughts that hold them back from happiness. So I incorporate all I know about healing people from depression, and anxiety in my programs, um, because that makes a big difference in their ability to recover. So people with depression also, we've known for many, many years, uh, they experience more pain and more illness in general, whether or not that's depression is, whether that's, um, inflammation mediated or whether it's because depression makes people focus more on the things that hurt them. Not clear, but probably inflammation is, is a big part of that as well. And why we have diseases like fibromyalgia, which are inflammatory diseases uh, in people who have depression, anxiety, and pain. So absolutely, there's a connection there. All right, let's, um, uh, Facebook. Okay. Thank you, Vajnam. Let me see. Um, Amanda, does seafood cause the same amount of inflammation as, uh, oh, it just disappeared, but I'm guessing as other meats. So that is an interesting question. So I don't know who does the PR for seafood, but they must be really, really good um, because seafood has long held this reputation that they are the healthy meat. Uh, and I have seen people uh, multiple times now who switched from meat uh, land animals to sea animals and ended up with mercury poisoning. Uh, I've seen at least two I can think of in the past year. Uh, so uh, that's one problem. But no, they are not uh, less inflammatory at this point. Um, so one is they have other fats in them. There's some saturated fat, there's, some, there's a lot of omega-6 fats, especially in the farmed ones, which are most of them now. So the farmed fish uh, are grown together grown. They are <laughs> captured and, and, and imprisoned in small areas where they are so close together, they get very sick and they share a lot of diseases. They feed them cheap stuff that's not their natural food, so they don't produce the omega-3 they normally would, and they have, um, and they have all these diseases in them as well. Uh, so those are the worst out there. Uh, but even when they did study years ago where the FDA was looking at fish from all over the world and testing um, testing levels of toxins in them. They found that there's a huge level of PCBs or environmental pollution from all of the industries we have all over the world that are in an, uh, fish fats because all that industrial pollution goes into the atmosphere, it rains down into the ocean and it's absorbed into the fish and it stays there. So when you're eating seafood, you're getting potentially illnesses and parasites and things from them being farmed. Even if they're free range, they're gonna have high levels of the environmental pollution in their fats um, and there's a mercury issue. So there's a lot of reasons to avoid them in general. Plus omega-3s are very sensitive to oxidation by air or heat. So if you're cooking fish, you are not getting the benefits of the omega-3, but if you don't cook them, then you could be getting the parasites. So I'm not a fan uh, of using fish at all. Uh, the most recent study that I found interesting was actually the study that they did. Uh, it was in the British Medical Journal looking at uh, the, the rates of moderate to severe COVID in people who were plant-based versus pescatarian versus high protein, low carb, keto paleo type folks uh, who are frontline workers, doctors and nurses on the front line dealing with COVID in the early onset of COVID before we had any treatments. This was in the days of the respirators 
and the morgue trucks out behind the hospital, the most terrifying phase of the pandemic, um, when doctors and nurses were really heroes uh, on the front lines treating folks, right? So they were looking at those folks and their rates of moderate to severe COVID and wh what they ate, which I thought was brilliant. I mean, you don't hear about them doing that too much. And what they highlighted in the study, which was the biggest outcome, which was very interesting, was that people who were plant-based, and they didn't even ask them like, what kind of vegan are you? Are you a junk food vegan? Are you a hyper nourishing vegan? Are you a no oil? They didn't even differentiate. Just if you are on the vegan spectrum, those folks had more than 70% lower cases of moderate to severe COVID compared to everybody else. More than 70% lower, which was enormous, huge, right? The people who were the high protein people who eat mostly meat, not very much, uh, fruits or vegetables, those folks had almost a 50% higher rate of moderate to severe COVID. So 70% reduction versus 50% higher rate, right? So that's what they really focused on. And so when they were discussing it, they said, well, maybe the, the reason for this is because there's no nutrients in meat, which is true. Um, there's no vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, all the things that your immune system needs to fight back and what your cells need to recover, they're not in meat. So that is very true. But what they didn't address was the inflammatory component of adding any animal products to the diet, right? That meat itself is deleterious to the human body. And I thought the most telling evidence of that was the pescatarians because pescatarians, they eat a lot of plant foods. The only animal product they eat is fish, right? So no dairy, no eggs tons of plants plus fish. So if the only issue was that the meat, the high meat eaters weren't getting enough nutrients, then the pescatarians would be as good as the plant eaters, right? That because they're getting all the nutrients. But what they found is the pescatarians had, I forget the number now, I have a whole video about this, but it was about a 50% uh, improvement or reduced chance of moderate to severe COVID compared to everybody else, which was really good, but a huge reduction, over 20% reduction from plants alone. So what that showed to me was the deleterious or harmful effect of even adding one animal product, fish, dramatically decreased protection against COVID. And they didn't really discuss that at all. So, uh, so I don't see a benefit, but that study alone just showed how animal products, even fish, can negatively impact immune function, not only in things like autoimmune disease, which is what I help people reverse every day, but in immune function in going after things like threats, like serious deadly viruses. Okay, let me see, I can get, I think I can do one more round. Let's see what, what Instagram has for me. All right, so Melissa, any experience on SLE affecting the kidneys? I have lupus and glomerulonephritis. I take my fortic daily. I need to come off it before getting pregnant, which we'll be trying for in the near future. Uh, so yes, I did just address this a little bit. Um, first of all, I had lupus nephritis and I had it for 12 years. And while medicines kept me alive and kept going, I always had proteinuria. I always had evidence of kidney issues. 17 years ago, I did this protocol. I was the first one to do it. And I said, goodbye lupus and no more proteinuria, no more sequela of any disease. And I've never had a relapse in 17 years, including having two kids, all right? So yes, absolutely. And you want to heal this before getting pregnant. Uh, I mean, you do what you wanna do, obviously. I'm not telling you what to do. So please excuse me for that. I mean, in my opinion, the most important thing that you can do if you want to be a mom is get healthy, right? If you have lupus nephritis that's active and you get pregnant, uh, it could cause more kidney failure, it could cause more lupus, uh, it could cause problem, heart block in the babies, it could cause miscarriage and more just devastation. Um, and I don't want you to have devastation. I want you to have happiness and joy. So what I would do is do this first. Now, I'm not the first one to, I, I am the first one to do it, but I'm not the only one. I have helped so many people reverse lupus nephritis. I've published reversing lupus nephritis and end stage kidney failure, getting off the transplant list. I post results about it all the time. Um, the kidneys love this program. It works extremely well. So do it fully though. The kidneys really benefit most from the pure hyper nourishment raw program. It is the less, the least fun because there's no, avocados and stuff if you're if you're sensitive to things like uh, potassium. Usually with kidney failure, I like to do it with you because I need to look at your blood test, see what you can actually eat. Regular hypernourishment, uh, sometimes that'll overdose the bloodstream uh, in things like potassium or water intake compared to what the kidney can do. If it's early onset where you have no food restrictions, then you can do just regular pure hypernourishment. But I have found even a little bit of cooked food slows down kidney recovery for a lot of people. So that's when I go into the raw program. But if you're late stage or you already have a, a negative impact on your ability to eat certain foods, work with me. Let's get rid of the lupus as quickly as possible 
and then you can go on and do all those other things you want to do. So the best way to do it would be something like rapid recovery because we got to get the, we got to get the kidneys on track. And, uh, with rapid recovery, I get to talk to you every day and make sure everything's going well. And you can show me your labs regularly too. So I can watch and make sure kidney function improves usually within a few days. So every week you can get tests and we can check your potassium and your sodium and your electrolytes, as well as your GFR, your creatinine, all that kind of stuff. Your doctor will have to order it, but I can peep at it. Um, and that way we can make sure the nutrition is what you need, but you're not overdosing in any way and make sure you're getting better. Um, so that's my recommendation for getting better as quickly as possible with the highest level of oversight. So if you can do that, I tr strongly recommend it so we can make sure the program's right. And then you'll send me the pictures of the cute babies that happen later. I love when people send me their baby pictures. It's just the best thing ever. All right. Uh, one more from Smoothie Shred. Leo, what do you got? Some good one. Uh, one says, uh, are allergies considered autoimmune? All right, are allergies autoimmune? No, allergies are not autoimmune, but they are mediated by the inflammatory immune system. So your immune system's inflammatory response has multiple different, there's, it's more complex than I make it seem, but there's different types of inflammatory response. So you have the inflammatory response that your body uses to, to go after infections, viruses, bacteria. Uh, there's also the inflammatory response that could cause your reaction to perceived threats that we call allergies, right? So when it's an allergy means something that's not actually bad for us, our immune system interprets it as threatening and just puts on this whole immune response and that itself can become an illness in itself. So um, I've had mixed things with allergies. Uh, a lot of people tell me their allergies go away. In my group, in Smoothie Shred, people just say their allergies went away. Uh, I think it depends how long you've had them. If it's been a lifetime allergy, I don't expect it. Uh, like my husband, definitely allergic to cats as long as I've known him. Uh, as far as I know, he still is. Although I think he, I also know he doesn't want cats. So it could be that he's better and he just hasn't, hasn't admitted to it yet. I'm gonna have to test that theory. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, more, but what I often see is that um, when people develop autoimmune, they often develop more allergies. People who never had food sensitivities before suddenly have them. And I've also seen the opposite where people suddenly develop allergies and food sensitivities and then down the road develop autoimmune. So they definitely are connected and related and potentially they can get better by doing the same program. All right, let's see one more good one from, uh, from the Goodbye Lupus Facebook page. All right. Okay. Rooftop. Does the inflammatory immune system have a memory? Question. Once you have autoimmune, is there a possibility of the disease recurring after one has gone through healing? It's a really good question. I've never heard it phrased that way before. I would say the simplest answer would be yes. Right? So once you've gotten sick, then you know that under the right circumstances, you know what disease you can develop, right? When people have cancer and they get a recurrence of illness, it's usually another cancer, right? When people uh, develop different kinds of heart issues, it's gonna be another type of heart issue, high blood pressure, and then moving on to arrhythmia or other issues, right? Um, if you have autoimmune, that's your jam, right? So like my body by 16, you know, arthritis, rashes, kidney failure, right? That, that's what my body will do if I take really bad care of it, right? Um, so yes you can definitely, you know what you're able to do, right? You know what your body will do if you mistreat it. Um, it's not guaranteed that you will. I mean, like I said, I'm 17 years out. Um, I'm currently trying to publish. It's so hard to publish studies because um, magazines like really, I want to get mainstream magazines, research magazines. They don't want to publish anything to do with nutrition and they don't want to publish case studies. And I can't do a large clinical trial. I am one person who from morning to night is seeing people in healing diseases. I'm not often, I'm not like, uh, you know, sitting at a research institution, you know, running trials. So, uh, so it's hard. But anyway, the one that I'm trying to publish right now is uh, multiple cases of people who had lupus and Sjogren's who have done my program over four years ago, reversed their disease on rapid recovery within a few weeks and have never had a relapse, All right? So, uh, so if you follow the way I teach it, where you go from, you know, uh, where you do maintenance way I tell you to, once you're in remission, your labs are negative, you have no symptoms, there's no reason it should ever get back. The people I see who regress are the ones who they get the remission and they feel great and then they give up the antidote. I do not understand this. If you find the antidote to autoimmune disease and it happens to be a green smoothie, then you marry that. You keep it every day. I have my green smoothie every day. I will never give it up, right? Because it's my antidote. So even though I'm lupus free 17 years, 
I'm not, and it's been 30 years since I was diagnosed. I'm going to be 46 in February. Um, I'm not going to give up my antidote, right? So what happens is people give up the antidote, they cut back on eating fresh foods, and then they start introducing more inflammatory and processed stuff, and then they end up eating more and more of the processed stuff, sometimes even meat and dairy again, and then boom, they're back in the same boat. So um, you want to be really, really careful, and I don't recommend you introduce anything pro-inflammatory, even a processed food, until you've been symptom-free, normal for six months, why mess with it? Just enjoy hypernourishment, cook plant foods, and enjoy your health, right? Um, so it, it's kind of like if, you, um, if you're trying to heal, uh, I've done a lot of videos about this, that healing is not like a light switch. You have to create enough disease in order to get a symptom. And then when you heal the disease, you can get to the point where you no longer have symptoms, but you still have this much disease left to go. So if you, if you go back to your wrong eating, you can come right back over that threshold again. We want to get you all the way back down to zero again. All right. I got time. Uh, oh, I don't even have time, but I'll, I'll do one more. And then I've got to go to my kid's school. He's doing a performance. I got to see. All right, um, my younger one is a singer and an actor. So uh, I wanna see, I wanna go see him. Um, okay, let me see if there's anything that might be, um, okay. All right, uh, try to pick something everyone can relate to. Osteoarthritis, so Kelly Bell, uh, can protocol help pains from severe osteoarthritis in hip or help me avoid surgery? So yes. Um, we're not going to grow new padding and joints, all right? So if osteoarthritis, if you've worn off your joint paddings or you don't have any, you're not going to grow a new one. But what my protocol will do is it will reduce the inflammation around the joints and hydration will fill in padding within the joints. People who are dehydrated have flat pads. If you get super hydrated, you can fill them in. So that can reduce pain and symptoms and inflammation and that could potentially alleviate it enough that you don't need surgery. I've had many people who did rapid recovery with me for autoimmune, who by the way needed a new hip because they were told it was osteo, and within a couple of weeks they didn't have that hip pain anymore. So it's definitely worth doing. Okay, so uh, that is uh, my hour. I will be doing this every week now. I wanna make sure that I'm giving to you guys as much as possible. Hopefully you learned from other people, even if I didn't get to your question. Uh, I'm doing my best, guys. I know I'm impossible to reach, like on Facebook Messenger, as Instagram messenger, I have an automatic reply there because I can't keep up and be a mom and like ever leave this office. So, um, so I, I, I try my best to be out there for you guys. If people are working with me, they can always text me, but otherwise it's, it's hard for me to keep up and I know and I try. Uh, even with emails, um, I answer as many as I can in a day and then at some point, it's like seven o'clock, I gotta leave the office and go see my family. So whoever got answered, it always like, wow, you answer so quickly. And then wherever I stop, they're like, why didn't she answer? I'm sorry, I'm really, really doing my best. So I'm trying my best to be there for you guys and help you as much as I can. Um, and so hopefully this will be a helpful new addition to what I do. Um, if you are trying to work with me, you can always go to goodbyelupus.com. I have wellness appointments and we have a group starting January 13th. If you can't get enough and you want to hear this every day, if you want to hear me talking to you all the time, that's the way to do it. Um, but otherwise, uh, for those of you who are just using this free content and trying to help yourself, I hope this made a big difference for you. I hope every single one of you uh, gets your health back and that you live the life that you want to live the way I've gotten to and the way so many people, uh, other people all over the world have gotten to. So that's all for today. I will see you guys next week. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and end these one at a time. Bye, Instagram. And then bye, Facebook. And bye, Smoothie Shred.